It's warm. A single mom with no job and two kids in New Hampshire, home of the first in the nation primary, is eligible for more than $30,000 a year in benefits. Senator, how do you help and incentivize her to go to work? Well, the answer is first that uh, we need to do something about a tax code that does penalize. One thing that, that I'm really excited about our tax code, uh, pr proposed changes, is very pro-family. It's very, pro you have a $2,700 tax credit, period, for every person in that family. You know, let's not forget, that single mom I was talking about in New Hampshire, she's in many cases making a pretty rational choice. I mean, if she can even find a job, she needs to find childcare. And oftentimes she may conclude that she's better off living off government benefits. So what is the role of policy in all this? Are we actually creating a culture of dependency? Joining me right now, Matt Welch, editor-in-chief of Reason Magazine, and Ralph Reed, founder and chairman of the Faith and Freedom Coalition. Um, Matt Reed, I'll, I'll start, or rather Ralph Reed, I'll start with you. Uh, you know, I, I think we, we're our humane society. We want to do what's best for every person and we want to make sure that they have an opportunity to succeed. But in doing so, we have run a risk here and the risk is that we're making it somehow more advantageous to not go to work, to not right. pursue something. How do, we, how do we navigate this in the way of policy? I mean, what could, should be done and should this be on the agenda? right now of Republicans in this election? Well, I think it should, Trish, and I think, I think you're raising it last night uh, was one of the more important moments in the debate because I think what we really need and actually what Rick Santorum and a lot of other of the candidates on the stage have talked about is sort of the next wave of welfare reform. In the 1990s, when I was then at the Christian Coalition, we moved two million people from welfare to work. We reformed welfare. Uh, we instituted time requirements, we instituted work requirements. Why? Because we believed that welfare had created a culture of dependency that made it more attractive for some not to work and to be dependent upon government than it was for them to work and learn and save. And I think similarly, we're at that point again, primarily with Medicaid, with food stamps, and with other government benefits. Uh, so what we favor at Faith and Freedom Coalition mm -hmm. Is, is looking at doing the same kinds of things with those programs that we did with welfare, uh, starting with food stamps, block grant them back to the states, reduce them, time limit them, so that people are incentivized to work. Secondly, we do favor uh, either a larger standard deduction per family or a child tax credit. We can debate the amount so that we're providing needed tax relief what about, what about to some, middle I'm class jump in families. Here, Matt. What, what about workfare? I mean, why, why, do we, why do we penalize people? Why do you have to have a cutoff level there at, at, at a certain amount? I mean, isn't there a way to find um, a path for that mom with two kids so that she can go to work, she can manage to pay for childcare, and she can find a path out of that dependency culture she may have gotten stuck in? One of the problems is that the economy that we've had and that we've seen over the past, not just eight years or seven years, but the last 15 years, is that the most kind of depressed end of the scale is right there. It's entering the workforce. You have a democratic regime right now in states and cities as well as federally that is just trying to add a lot of burdens right at the lower level. They're trying to boost the minimum wage to $15 an hour or for mm -hmm. selected uh, categories. And so you're going to reduce the number of jobs that are available there. So that's a bad combination. Okay, of you're things. talking about minimum wage. We are going to talk about that coming up. Um, but, you know, it, it's challenging. And I asked Senator Santorum this, how do you get elected when you're the guy or gal that wants to cut the benefits for Americans that are dependent on them? I mean, it, it, it's, it's challenging because you've got to be offering some kind of new solution to this problem and still somehow get elected. Let's face it, you can have all the ideas in the world. If you can't get elected, how do you implement them? And it's yeah, challenging but, if one Trish, side I, is going to give out all kinds of free stuff. Trish, can I say Go something ahead. on that? Very quickly, um, yes. I, I, mm -hmm. I agree with what Mike Huckabee said in the undercard debate, which is people who are on government benefits, people who are living in poverty or near poverty, 
their dream of what they want their life to look like is not to be on Medicaid and food stamps. It's to have a job, to have dignity, to have an education, and be able to provide a better future for their children. You offer that kind of hopeful, optimistic vision. You not only will get the votes of uh, the traditional Republican grassroots, you will get the votes of a lot of people, including in the minority community, who have not always felt welcome on our ranks. That's the message, and we need to unapologetically make that our message. And let's remember that last night, Matt Rand and Paul Ralph. and Ted Cruz both uh, advocated eliminating the payroll tax, which would help poorer Americans in a way that's, uh, that's uh, very disproportional and interesting. There's, there's a lot on the table, and it's good that we're talking about it. It's good to have you guys here. Matt and Ralph, thank you so much.